Well, good morning and greetings from the metropolis of Dundee, Michigan, where I now find myself living, but still connected to many of you here in Dearborn. Today, we are going to continue our look, our journey of fascination, really, with our compassionate King, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom and its impact on earth, its ever-increasing impact on earth, even through the likes of us. May we never recover from this journey of being fascinated with our king because the scriptures say the answer to most of our problem is, problems are, I should say, we have more than one, uh, is when our eyes get off of Jesus, when anything becomes more central or more overwhelming to our perspective than he himself. As Hebrews 12, 2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Just a little aside, probably a reminder for many of you, maybe not for others, um, we're going through the book of Matthew to do this, which is a great layout, as Brad has shown us, where the king is revealing himself in his kingdom. You know there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was one of the 12, also known as Levi. He was a tax collector. And each of the four gospel writers kind of either announce overtly the focus of their gospel, or it's very clear by implication. So in Matthew's case, he is primarily trying to convince Jews that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. And because of that, there are more quotations from the Old Testament in Matthew than the other three Gospels combined. We won't go into what the other Gospels are about, except I do get a kick out of Luke saying, many have undertaken to write an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, and I thought it would be good to try an orderly one. Um, so that's why every movie about Jesus is based on Luke, because he's the only one who claims to be chronological. The other guys were like, oh, and then there was this one time. Um, but anyway, be that as it may, the central thrust of today's passage, Matthew 15, 1 through 20, is the importance of following his commands over our traditions. And that is a very subtle and insidious problem that we can easily have as we pursue God. Our compassionate provider king tells us that his word, his commands are enough. In a sense, it's almost as if, he, as if he's saying to us today, don't make this harder than it needs to be. <laughs> uh, my commands are what you need. And, and John tells us in 1 John 5 that God's commands are not burdensome when we're looking at them and living them out rightly. But this thing of adding tradition to it is tough. Well, let me just pray for us one more time about this passage of Scripture particularly, and I will invite you to stand with me in preparation to be standing for the reading of Scripture, if you're able to do that, whether you're here with us or watching online. Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would again reveal yourself to us through your word and through this time of interacting over it. We need nothing more than we need to see you in a fresh and compelling way. Everything else falls into place when we do that. Lord, in Psalm 40, verse 7, uh, the psalmist said of you, Jesus, behold, I come in the volume of the book. Many have said that you were the Bible with skin on, but the reverse is true. The Bible is you, Jesus, in print, and we ask you to bring it alive for us. In John 8, 58, you said, before Abraham was, I am. And in John 14, 9, you said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Lord, for your glory, show us the Father today through our time in your word. We ask in your own name, amen. Well, if you can stay standing, we're going to read Matthew 15, verses 1 through 20. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might have otherwise received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching, 
Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they're blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Amen. You can be seated. Interesting time that we're uh, in to read about how important or unimportant hand washing is. (laughs) Uh, I don't think Jesus was advocating dirty hands. His point was you're you're straining out a net to swallow a camel. Remember when he said that? And in in Mark's account of this same interchange with the Pharisees, he said, thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions. And he added, and you do many things like that. It's not just this one issue. You know, uh, let me just read the main points that we're going to look at today together based on this passage. Uh, The first point, if you don't have the uh, uh, outline with you, they are available back there. But uh, the first one is traditions and trajectories. The, The next one is kingdom culture, hearts over heads and hands. And last is from dogma and duties to wonder and with. What are the takeaways and applications for each of us this morning from this passage? Let's get into the traditions and trajectories. Now, I want to mention that the context of this whole experience, you know, where the the Pharisees come up and say, hey, how come you guys don't wash your hands like you're supposed to? Jesus has just finished uh, walking on water, feeding 5,000 people, and a mass of healings, miraculous healings. And their question is, Notice you don't wash your hands like you're supposed to. Wow, you talk about missing it. Uh, But what Jesus does is is he just goes right into dealing with that in a confrontational way, their question about the tradition of a certain kind of hand washing. And this was not just wash your hands before you eat. It was a very religious rite, ceremonial cleansing that Jews did, Orthodox Jews did before they ate. It wasn't just like what we call hand washing. It was a big deal. So the first takeaway I think of as I relate to this is our attempts at extra credit take us off course. You know, it's like we don't think it's enough to just obey God. We've got to do something superhuman or or, or extra. That's why the uh, Pharisees, for the laws that are in Scripture, I forgot the exact numbers, but they wrote kind of corollary laws that were like four times as many as the number of commands in the Old Testament. So they they made it four times as hard and four times as precise as what God had to say. When we do these things, when we have these extra credit or tradition things that take us off course, they put us on the road to self-reliance and rigidity rather than on the road to faith and grace. It becomes more about us and less about him. Have you ever known someone like this or Perhaps many of us have been someone like this and slip into it still. Uh, Here's some some comments from some friends of mine over the years about this rigid, legalistic, tradition-centered walk with God. Uh, I met with a midshipman named Chris Smith once at the Naval Academy, and we were starting our one-to-one time, which we did about weekly. And I said, well, what, what do we need to talk about? And he said, well, I've had good quiet times this week, my morning devotions. I've memorized two verses as we planned on, and he kind of went down this list of things, and he said, so I think I'm all caught up on my spiritual calisthenics. Could we talk about my life? Uh, wow, spiritual calisthenics, that was, that was an eye-opener. And then, you know, by the way, when we, when we add these extra rules or put all this emphasis on traditions that are extra biblical, have you noticed we become more judgmental? At least in our hearts, we might hide it well. 
I mean, we're living in a time right now where we know half the people are judging people for wearing masks and half the people are judging people for not wearing masks. It's just one more thing we can judge each other on, subtly, inside at least. I uh, did a message once from Romans 14 and I entitled it, Have Gavel, Will Travel, Our Tendency to Judge. And that gets only exacerbated when we have all these focus on extra biblical rules and traditions. One of my mentors, Bill Cassidy, used to call it majoring on the minors. Majoring on the minors, doesn't that sound sad? <laughs> Instead of majoring on the majors. Another friend of mine um, named Lauren White said, you know what we're really doing is we're deifying our opinions. The way we like to approach our walk with God, we want to give it the weight as if God said that's the way it must be done. And uh, my pastor in Dayton, Ohio, Randy Warner, had a little thing hanging over his desk that says, when I get to heaven, I don't want God to say to me, gee, I didn't mean for you to have such a crummy time down there. <laughs> you know, I mean, we just all have seen this. And all these little phrases from my friends really grow out of this tendency for us to take ourselves and our self-efforts way too seriously and squeeze all the joy out of the Christian life. Well, the specific issues that were raised in this passage were two. First was the one the Pharisees brought up, the ceremonial hand-washing versus the internal cleansing. But Jesus then added another issue to the one they brought up, the issue of Corban, C-O-R-B-A-N. Corban, we know it's called that, this idea of let's, let's take the help we were supposed to give our parents in their old age and make it a special gift for God and take it away from them. In the account of Mark, it names it. It's the word Corban. That's what that special gift is called. And in this case, Jesus contrasts Corban versus caring for your aging parents. But this can show up in other contexts, can it? Where in the name of some extra sacrifice to God, what we're really doing is pulling back on loving and serving people. And then, uh, basically, if you notice that religious rules are more about me and kingdom values and commands are more about Jesus and others. When it starts to become about me and my whole view of whether I'm having a good walk with God has to do with my efforts and disciplines and practices, then I'm going off course. Now the next thing I wanna mention is that doctrine over devotion is a bedfellow of tradition over commands. Doctrine over devotion. We live in a very heady time. For most of the history of the body of Christ, people did not even have their own Bible. And if they had had one, most of them wouldn't have been able to read it because of their limits on literacy. Well, we have it so available to us that to do our Bible study in the old days before they were on our phone like this, we had to uh, almost have a ping pong table to lay out all the translations and commentaries and, uh, you know, I used to use this thing called the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. We called it ISB for short. And each of the four volumes was big enough to choke a mule. And, and so it, we can just be very academic about this. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should. I mean, what a privilege that we have the scriptures that accessible to us. But when we get about knowledge more than experience with Jesus or doctrine over devotion, as I've called it, it's very similar to, to tradition over commands. Think about what forms this takes in our time. Are we debaters more than we are followers? Um, remember the Apostle Paul? When he first came to faith, he was this trained Pharisee with all this Bible knowledge. And someone said, a friend of mine named Jim Peterson said, he won all of the arguments and none of the people he was arguing with. And they sent him off to Tarsus so that the church of, might enjoy a period of peace. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? In the book of Acts, we read that. And he was in Tarsus being humbled and learning what it really means to love God, but not just his mind, but his heart and soul and strength for 14 years before he came back on the scene and was a different person in the way he influenced others. What forms can this take in our time? That's an interesting thing to ask. This is a time of doctrinal arguments. And it's not that there's no place for doctrine or even that there's no place for debates. But uh, a friend of mine once said, I can, I can tell you what apologetics is real quickly. We're right, you're wrong, and we can prove it. It's not very helpful <laughs> to influence hearts. We're right, you're wrong, and we can prove it. Uh, one time, 
We were in a, in a van driving, a bunch of navigator staff and our area leader, this is in the 80s, and one of them was telling a story about kind of a controlling cult-like church that was telling their folks in the Navy who were a part of their church that they shouldn't be involved with the navigators at the base or anybody else, just them. And one of the, um, one of the staff in the car said, wow, what's wrong with people like that? And our leader said, the same thing that's wrong with us. We think we're right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> And I just remember thinking, wow, that's true. How does this look in my life to put doctrine over devotion or tradition over commands? Well, I'm glad you asked because toward the end here, we're going to take some time to reflect on that. But you could even begin thinking now. Let me mention that the next item, as I mentioned here, is kingdom culture is hearts over heads and hands. Remember the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength? It's, it's all vitally important. Our mind, our will, our heart and soul, the place of our affections. But Jesus, what did he say to the woman at the well? He said, what kind of worshipers does, the God, does our God seek? Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Have any of you have seen uh, this, this kind of crazy thing on... Uh, well, it's, not, it's on TV after you push the app and tell it to put on your TV called The Chosen. Any of you seen that? Oh, not nearly enough of you. I couldn't recommend that high enough. We were going to play uh, a clip of it right here of Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well in John 4. Um, but we couldn't because even though the owner of it gives it permission, YouTube would shut us down when they saw a professional video being shown. And that would be the end of our service online when we showed that clip. But I would really encourage you, it's an app that you can get in the App Store, whether it's Android or Apple, for free called The Chosen. And when you push that app, it says, would you like to watch this on your TV? And if you hit yes, it asks you what kind of device you have, Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, whatever you got. You pick that. And then it says, oh, you mean that TV? It's kind of scary. It actually knows your TVs in your houses if you're on the same Wi-Fi network. And then you watch it. And it's free, although they do say this is the largest crowdfunded project of any kind in the history of the world which you consider a gift to pay it forward. But they don't bug you constantly. They just tell you about it once. It's, I, I could get lost talking about that. I'll just tell you this. You, you won't find this too shocking, knowing me. Um, I cry in every episode. <laughs> it's just so good. Uh, really brings, it, it magnifies Jesus in one way and brings him down to earth in another. It's just really fantastic. Well, so hearts over heads and hands, like Jesus said to the woman at the well. As she's walking away in this episode, this little clip, this eight-minute clip of her, you can find it on YouTube. Just, just type in the chosen woman at the well, and you'll see it. But when she wa she's starting to walk away from him, she's crying. She said, spirit and truth, right? And he says, right. And you can see tears in Jesus' eyes. And he said, soon, just the heart because they've been debating about the way you worship and where you worship. It's beautiful. Well, I want to go back to the fact that this is a very bizarre question by the religious leaders. After Jesus had just healed hundreds, walked on water, and fed 5,000, their question was, you're not washing your hands exactly right. Is that missing the boat, or what, literally, in this sense, because Jesus, you know, got into a boat after he walked on the water. But even if they didn't know about that precisely yet, the walking on the water thing, the crowd had kind of figured out, wait a minute, he's over on this shore and he didn't get in the boat when they left what happened. But they were, they were doing that straining out a gnat to swallow a camel thing, weren't they? All these great evidences of the kingdom of God were upon them and they were fixated on some little detail. The only thing they were missing was the boat, literally. In John 5, 39 and 40 is a passage I come back to again and again where Jesus said to them at another time, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you have life. These are the scriptures that testify about me and you refuse to come to me to have life. Again, the only thing they were missing was the boat. If my focus is my beliefs and my behaviors, as important as those things are, I will get lost in the minutia every time. I'm trying, it's like a friend of mine said, trying to live the Christian life that way is like trying to hold a thousand ping pong balls underwater in the bathtub. You get four down under and three more pop up, you know. It's just, 
it turns it into a treadmill instead of a relationship. Beliefs and behaviors are important, very much so. I mean, we spend time here, don't we, on that kind of stuff. We, we, back, back in the day, we had this thing called Ill, All In, and it was educational primarily, and a chance to process together and interact over it, not just a monologue. Beliefs are important, and, and the implications of the beliefs, how we ought to behave, is important. But when we make them preeminent, they become toxic. They're toxic if they're preeminent. If that's all of our perception of what following Jesus means is getting the right beliefs and the right behavior, we will live a very different life than he meant us to live as followers. Jesus says that worship is in spirit and truth. It is not about rules and rituals. Now, we all have rituals, don't we? I mean, for me, I'm pretty, I'm pretty invested in mine. I can't even imagine Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying without a cup of coffee and a nice chair, because that's my ritual. That's the way I do it every morning. I, I have this place that I always go to for my time with the Lord in the morning. If the weather's good enough, I'm outside on my front porch praying for the neighbors and reading the scriptures, and I just love it. Uh, and there's got to be coffee there. I know that's not in the Bible, but gosh, it ought to be, it seems like to me, you know. Um, and we all have those rituals, those ways of approaching God, and it's fine. Have you, ever, have you ever read a book or heard of a book called Sacred Pathways? None of you, okay, that's a good one. Oh, there you go, Chris. Extra credit, I'll give you your prize afterwards. Um, uh, Sacred Pathways is all about the fact that the way that works for other people may not be the way that works for you to walk with God. I know people that the way I do it, they say that could never work for me. My mind would wander, or I'd fall asleep if I sat down to read the Bible and pray. I have to walk around, either in my house if the weather is bad or outside, and I read out loud and I pray out loud while walking, or else I won't be able to focus on God. Great, that's their sacred pathway. That really wouldn't work as well for me. So we all have our rituals, but it's not about those rituals. What we want to do is deify our preferences, as my friend Lauren White said. We want to tell everybody, now here's the way you meet with God. And it's a bunch of stuff that isn't even in the Bible. That's what we can do, and that's what the Pharisees were doing. Now let me shift with you um, to the last part, which is about our personal reflections on all of this. From dogma and duties, which is just another way of saying beliefs and behavior, I like it because they both start with D. You know me well enough to know that. To wonder and with. You say, what I hope, and I'm sure Brad is praying that this is happening for him as well as for all of us in this whole series, is that we're captivated with wonder at who Jesus is and how he's revealing himself through the book of Matthew and by extension in our everyday lives. And I said wonder and with because I've just read a book that really says it well. I already believe this. This is why I think it's a great book. It, it's, it's kind of stroked my, my biases and prejudices. And guess what the book is called? With. A new way to look at your relationship with God. And the author says that there are four most popular or prominent postures towards God. And none of them are with. He talks about life over God, which is basically God has nothing to do with your actual real life decisions and practices. Life under God, where you're kind of thinking of him as someone you got to keep from getting angry at you, keep him on your side. Life uh, from God, where you're always saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. That's where the prosperity gospel comes in. Life for God, which is pretty prominent in evangelicals like us. Uh, it's all about me doing something for God, right? And we should do things for sure. But this guy says, no, it's with not for, not from, not over, not under, with God. And he makes a great case in the scriptures. So we want to go from dogma and duties, beliefs and behaviors, to wonder and with. Wonder at Jesus and with Jesus in all we do and think and experience. I'm going to go back to those examples that are in this passage, and I'm going to ask you to take a few moments to reflect on how they might be showing up in your life and we will not have an open mic time of confession afterwards. Um, may not be the best for your soul, and we don't have time. But I am going to ask you and God to, to think this things through. So let me, let me outline them first, 
and then we will, uh, I will kick us off in prayer and give you some time. So the first example, again, was Corbin versus caring. In, John, in uh, Matthew 15, 6, here in our passage, uh, Jesus talks about nullifying the word of God by taking a command and sort of somehow turning it into some extra credit sacrifice that's about me and actually circumvents the command. Is there anything like that? I'm gonna ask as we're praying, are there traditions that I hold like their commands or even in place of commands like this one? The second example was washing versus cleansing. Washing being an outward activity that the Pharisees were espousing and cleansing being an inward reality. Remember when Jesus said, the cleansing needs to happen inside in your heart and it's what comes out of your mouth as a result of where your heart is that matters, not what goes into your mouth. Washing versus cleansing. Are there truths that I believe, but they're only external to me? They don't reach in and transform my heart. And then the third thing I added was the power of powerless teachers. I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who knows a lot about the Bible, but it feels like you're talking to God's press agent, you know, where it's like, I'm not sure any of this is real to them, even though they seem to know so much. And I ask myself, as I look at verses 12 through 14, Jesus says, you know, the disciple said, "Uh, excuse me, do you know you offended those guys? And Jesus said, they're blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, they'll both fall into a pit. Ask yourself, what is the nature of my spiritual influence on other people? How do they experience or see my relationship with God? Is it contagious or is it off-putting? So, bottom line, not that you've got to have an answer to all those things, but I hope God speaks to you on one of them, is you're asking, Lord, what do you want me to leave with today and perhaps take action on tomorrow? So I'm going to uh, just start by reading verses eight and nine aloud in prayer, and then I'm gonna give you some uncomfortable silence. And I'll remind you in the midst of that silence here and there of the three things that you could at least ask the Lord about one of them, all right? So let's pray. And Father, I wanna read this passage that Jesus quoted out of Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are just rules taught by men. Father, you know that's not what we want to be like, and yet we fight that tendency. Lord, I would ask that um, as my friends and I sit here in your presence, just marinating in your presence, would you help us just like this issue of Corbin versus caring? Are there traditions that we as individuals tend to hold like they're a command or even in place of one of your commands? Would you reveal that to us as we muse in your presence right now? And likewise, Father, like the washing on the outside versus the cleansing on the inside, are there truths that we genuinely believe but somehow they've stayed only external to us, concepts and uh, dogma rather than things that actually transform our heart and the way we live? Would you reveal that to us right now, Lord? And finally, Father, as we think about what Jesus said about blind guides, we wonder if you'd give us a glimpse at what our spiritual influence is like with others. Are we experiencing you in a joyful, 
transformative way that makes others wonder, wow, what's the secret of the way that person is living in the way, in, in the midst of all the struggles that I have too? Or Lord, does it look more like a pressure and a duty and a treadmill and they want nothing to do with that? Would you reveal to us what our spiritual influence is like on those around us? Lord, perhaps you've spoken very um, powerfully and clearly to a few of us, but probably most of us, we don't have things tied up in a bow after that short time in your presence. But perhaps you have brought something to our attention that we need to process further with you and or each other. Um, would you give us the courage to be that real about our walk with you, to revisit this, and even maybe bring a few trusted kingdom friends in into the boat with us to think about this. Thank you that the essence of the gospel is that you have cleansed us. We can never be good enough. We can never do enough extra credit to tilt the scales away from the weight of our sin, but you have removed it from us in Jesus Christ if we put our faith in you. Let us not remember it's about Jesus and not about us. Help us to remember that always and not forget it. We ask in his name, amen.